like phones don't have that problem, but no, all computers have seem problem. to. Have... My phone changes its brightness settings all the time on its own. Well, a lot of phones are made to do I that. I did not consent to that. No, I'm not. <laughs> it, I don't like it. I did not consent. <laughs> you have to. You have to turn turn Why off auto, auto brightness. <laughs> I have turned it off about three hundred. Oh. And it, it keeps turning off. itself back on. No, I've never had that problem before. Mine comes back on, and like, like it'll do it when it like senses outdoor lighting at random. So I'll like, be like, "Why am I squinting?" Uh, I like yeah. my screens on maximum bright. I'm like one of those people. Mm -hmm. Most people it's apparently. Like, Ooh, I want my phone to die. All you have to do is just call the NSA agent who's been assigned to you and have them go through your settings on your phone and he'll take care of it Excuse for me. you. Can you like stop? <laughs> like, like just, just, just stop making my screen go dim. It's, it's, it's really, what, what we, I, I don't remember actually dialing know, you. What we don't know, didn't know until today is the fact that the NSA is the biggest employer of the, in the United States because each person is assigned their own NSA right. agent. Welcome to the Casual Fanatics. This is the podcast where we take a pop culture question and go, well, what about this thing? And it just involves the three of us kind of going over the why of the question with our own examples. Uh, we're probably not going to do a competition today, but maybe I'll put some participation trophies photoshopped in later on just because I feel like it and I can. I'm the one who edits this, so it's up to me. Anyway, that's Jeremy Brazil. Say hey, Jeremy. Hey, hey. That's Sydney Johnson. Say hey, Sydney. Hey. Don't tell me what I to do. I am yeah. telling, I'm in the top square, dang it. If this were Hollywood I Squares, I'd be mean the ruler of y'all. I am Paul Stanton. I Stan. do what I want. I do, well, you do uh, what I want, what I really, really want. I am Paul Stadden, yeah. and this is the podcast uh, where we're going to be talking about what properties did you not like, did you think were terrible, or just maybe even in pop culture were considered really bad, and then later on got a critical reappraisal, or you just came to really, really enjoy this is one of those weird things where you talk about uh, the subjectivity of whether you like something or not and trying to put it in objective terms. We've talked about coming up with our own uh, casual fanatic score and trying to do objective ratings of things, uh, which I still have yet to Photoshop. Maybe I'll put it at the end of the episode. Who knows? I was really hoping I was ready. It's easy to say these things now because I haven't done it yet and I can make that on future Paul. That's future Paul's problem. <laughs> uh, future Paul is going to be very upset at me. Uh, but, but you love Future Paul. He's uh, your favorite person. I'm Future Paul for past Paul's uh, uh, mistakes. So I'm very annoyed at past Paul. I'm, I'm just always annoyed at past Paul. But I, I have a few properties that have really jumped to mind about why I didn't like them in the beginning and then why I really came to like them. Um, some of this has come about because I tend to be a contrarian and tend to just not like things that are popular uh, and then kind of jump on the bandwagon late. But my first example that I'm going to talk about uh, was not that. I think it was the experience that I had when I first saw it that really turned me off of it. And that was the movie, The Dark Knight. When I first saw it in the theater, I hated it. I didn't like it. Um, part of it was... I think actually the entirety of it was in the theater where I was watching it. I don't feel like the audience was really taking the material to the way that it was supposed to be the way Christopher Nolan was presenting it, where people were kind of laughing at the Joker's antics rather than finding him terrifying. And he's supposed to be terrifying. He's supposed to be a character that isn't doing things. We go like, Oh, I'll bet that hurt. But more like, Oh crap, he's terrifying and horrible. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Michael Caine's first scene with uh, the Joker in it, he saw Heath Ledger's makeup and Heath Ledger for the first time, and he was so imposing, Michael Caine forgot his line. And that's the take that they use in the movie, where he's just like, I don't know what to even say to this. Um, and that's the way that you're supposed to approach the Joker, because that was the first... Now, as much as I love The Dark Knight, and as much as I love Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker in The Dark Knight, that did kick off this whole thing of villains who just do random crap instead of having a motivation. Uh, the biggest example of that being Lex Luthor in Batman versus Superman, where he just does whatever because he's crazy, which isn't an interesting motivation. You know, when you can't follow what a character is going to do, you lose interest. And well, Christopher Nolan treated it really well. 
Yeah, it was like he he meant to be a direct foil to Batman who used his knowledge to figure out what the villain's motivation was and how to stop him. And it, right. it, it took it took uh it took Alfred coming along and saying, sometimes they just do it to do it. Right. And, Which is a great yeah. reveal. A reveal of of, of motivation and such and the reason that it works is because it's such an antithesis to everything you've seen in villains in media up to that point. And that's why when I was watching it and the audience was like laughing at the jokers and like, oh, shows the pencil in the guy's brain. I'm like, oh, that's, that's terrible. And people are like, oh, ha, ha. I'm like, people sociopaths. Like it was a really yeah. unpleasant thing to have people like laughing as jokers blowing up the hospital. I'm like, he just killed a bunch of people. Like, oh, the hospital is empty. Probably not completely if we're being honest here and probably most of the people inhaling all that dust are going to get horrible cancer. Like we saw from. You are, you're running way too much thought into this movie. Like, so there, it deserves it. It deserves is, it. No, but there is something to be said for like the shock value. Cause like you've talked about this quite a bit. So um, yeah. a friend actually like, and I went back and watched the scene and she's like, think about the first time you saw it. And there is a, Okay, so I have a terrible story where a friend of mine once gave me horrible news about a family member, and I won't disclose that on here because they may or may not hear this, right. but they, they got some terrible news about a family member, and they came over to my house, and they told me what was going on, and I laughed. I, like, outright just busted out laughing. I was like, that doesn't happen. Right. And it was, it was terrible news that they received, and I'm like, I'm sorry. I know I'm inappropriately laughing, but I'm, like, somewhat horrified and somewhat don't know how to react. And there is a moment of shock value in that first scene with the Joker with the pencil trick where, like, you're almost so stunned. It's not a sociopathic reaction. You're so stunned in that moment. You're like, oh, my God. He just did that. Yeah, that's not how the audience actually treated <laughs> That was like, a yeah, after. You know, did, you, did you pull the entire audience, Paul? Like, I, I asked each of them afterwards, yes. I, I went around with <laughs> well, the microphone. It, it, Sometimes you can tell the difference because you're like, oh, 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 oh my gosh, you had that exasperated sound. Well, yeah, it wasn't that. Other times, like, ha, 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 this guy pointing up at the screen. That's what it was. I'm not seeing people laugh at that scene. I've never seen any person laugh because they they like generally like, oh, that was funny. It's not funny. It's shocking. Yeah, I saw a couple high fives in the theater, so it was a. Uh... Yeah, I was just watching it. It was not a pleasant audience. I know. know. Uh, But then later on, watching it on my own, getting to kind of take it all in by myself, I realized the genius of the character, how the character was written and how the character was acted and portrayed by Heath Ledger. And I really came to appreciate that movie. But it was just, it was such a jarring experience because part of that is that uh, that's just not how I approach watching movies is, is like, I want to be horrified by what I'm seeing. And part of it was, I kind of came off of a, I remember watching, uh, in the theaters, it was, uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And I had a similar audience experience where like people were coming in kind of, they were coming in expecting like a hokey Hong Kong, uh, action flick where it's going to be over the top rainbird blood shooting out like a tarantino movie uh and so any exactly uh but any any bit of violence that happened like people were like yeah and i'm like no that's not fitting with the narrative (laughs) like it was easier to ignore then because it was so obviously out of place and so Mm -hmm. obviously not supposed what was the narrative was supposed to be but with the dark knight i was just conflating the two and i was unfairly treating the movie uh, like that was just kind of some Transformers uh, action you know, violence orgy, when instead it was a much more interesting uh, analysis of human nature of structure versus chaos, you know, structure of Batman and the chaos of the Joker, uh, and how those two approach life and how they think about other people and how they think. So the critical reappraisal in my head, I think was very necessary for that movie. That's the end of my point. <laughs> I felt I had to say that. <laughs> <'cause I'm... laughs> we, we, we're just like, 
Like, Do I have like, a microphone uh, I can uh, drop? Uh, like, <laughs> done. Boom. Boom. All right. That's good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's funny. It's like my, my, my example like has nothing to do with like the audience around me or anything like that. Oh, it's yours just, is not contextual, huh? Yeah. Well, it's like, I just sat down and watched it. and I just despised it. <laughs> and I, okay. I and, and, and it just seems like something that I should love. And it's like, so I kept trying. It, it was like this, this, uh, Stockholm syndrome of sorts <laughs> with Bob's burgers. Ah, uh, okay. So you didn't like it at first. Yeah, I immediately was like, I, oh, this is a cool show. You've said that before, and I'm shocked you didn't like it at first because it's right up your yeah. alley. It's 100% up my alley. And it's like that, that I, I kept trying to watch the first episode. And that was the mistake because there's this really cringy moments right at the beginning of that episode that I couldn't get through the first like five times I tried to watch it. Mm-hmm. And it's like it's like okay, I don't want to I don't want to hear this person talk about their rash as she's flipping burgers at the. <laughs> it's like fair. little that's things fair. like that. It was like I, I it's like I can't handle this. I See, but I'm like I'm already like that's hilarious. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like that's just yeah. real. That was that just, just, that's just life in the fast food joint, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> All right, no but, calling in sick. Your burger has a rash now. That's how it is. But like, I, I what turned I, it around for you? What turned it around? What what turned it around was the fact that I kept trying and I kept trying, and I started understanding that even just from that one episode, because I didn't go on to the second episode until I finished the first episode, and I started understanding the characters and how they were acting and things like that, and it's like, it, it's what draws me to. Futurama is what draws me to The Simpsons. It, most of my favorite shows is like, well, you know, you can watch one episode and it has nothing to relate to the other things, but there's this consistent character characterization of each person. It, it almost feels like you get to know who they are over time. Yeah. And th- the way they were portrayed just ended up drawing me in. And I was able to get past that first half of that first episode and from that point forward I just ended up starting loving the show like just seeing Tina actually like grow as a character from a person who couldn't perform as a tree in a <laughs> in a play in front of like just a tiny group of people to being like somebody up on stage singing a song is like that's that's nice character progression right there you know she's and become a much co- more confident person you know that's tough to do in a show where the characters don't age to have characters progress mentally without progressing physically that's that's tough plus you run the risk of alienating people who liked the character for what they were in the first place but that's Kind of the genius of Bob's Burgers because it's all stand-up comedians. Dan Mintz, it's uh, Ace John Benjamin, Kristen Schaal. Uh, so you have all of the – and uh, oh, gosh, I can't remember his, his name right now. Uh, Eugene Merman. So you have a lot of these people in the show are stand-up comedians, and they're improvising a lot of dialogue. Ace John Benjamin particularly loves to improvise <laughs> funny dialogue and is great at it. I don't know if it was a written line, but my favorite line he ever said was, so I think I smoked crack last night. And I'm pretty sure I liked it uh, when <laughs> Bob just wakes up under the grill. <laughs> like, where were you? <laughs> pretty sure I smoked crack last night. I think I liked it. Uh, you know, and that's such a an H. John Benjamin thing to improvise. Um, so they're able the, when a show can rely on the wit and the humor of the people that are involved in the creating of the show, you can do the kind of character growth that they do on Bob's Burgers and make it work for a long it was like 10 seasons now 11 yeah like we're going on season 10 yeah. season 10 yeah and they're making a movie out of it too so yeah it, it deserves it um i fell in love with the show with the beef squatch episode uh beef squatch that yeah, was the that, one that was like okay one. yep this is amazing oh yeah i mean the, there's a lot of shows that do like holiday episodes and most of the time, like, if I get to it, I automatically skip it. Yeah, yeah. Bob's Burgers Halloween and Thanksgiving episodes, I watch 
every single time. They they oh, yes. do such like two bars. I mean, full bars is one of the the best holiday shows ever made. Like it, it was just this episode where you know the ace the a plot is the kids going to the rich kid where the rich kids get their candy and they have full sized candy bars that they're handing out and they just freak out over it and they try to stay there as late as they can but they end up getting stuck in the island because hell hunt starts because all of the older kids start throwing water water balloons filled with pee and stuff like that at them. Yep. Yep. so oh, the, the b plot b plot is cost costume contest i mean in co- costume party where bob accidentally kills Teddy's gerbil. Uh, Pet but gerbil. he didn't really. <laughs> he he. Well, he did it on accident. Yeah. Well, actually, it was, what, what, but wasn't the gerbil uh, sat on or something? Or I forget how. how yeah. How he he was trying. He was trying. Like he didn't come with a costume, and he, yeah. Teddy was like, "Put one of one of these on." So he decides to put on the sumo costume while he's trying to put the sumo costume. He rolls over him over and over. Right. Right. He <laughs> oh, doesn't even oh. know it. Doesn't even know it. Teddy's so great. Like Bob's like Teddy, you're gonna you'll eat anything. He's like, that's not true. That's not true, Bob. Here, eat this. Oh, what was that? It was a sponge, Teddy. You you fed me a sponge, Bob. Like, Why yes. did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't have to eat it. You ate it. <laughs> uh, oh speaking God. of yeah. SpongeBob, uh, that's actually my other example. Uh, well, yeah. How about that for a segue? <laughs> I mean, I guess just go, Paul. I just take. No, I, I had. I, I, I will talk about Sponge. I don't want to. I don't want to hijack to my thing. But I, how about how often do you get that beautiful of a segue into your it's other example? Before Jeremy, and it would have worked. I know. I know. <laughs> oh well. Anyway, I'll, I'll get, to, I'll get to anyway. that later. So, uh, but oh Sydney, God. what was your, what was your example, Sydney? So, so my movie example, um, is actually probably still really unpopular. Um, but it's Hannibal Rising, the movie. Oh, wait, you is remember that this? the 2001 with uh, Anthony Hopkins and, uh, no, uh, no. <laughs> this is, this Hannibal Rising is the prequel. Oh, that's right. That's right. That was just Hannibal, right? That was just Hannibal. What am I thinking? Um, no, Hannibal Rising. Oh my seven. gosh. I forgot this existed. No one remembers it exists except for me. And okay. So I... <sighs> Okay, this movie, the critical reviews of this movie are really bad. I had to go look them up. It's bad. Mm. Um, I mean, it had the tomato it was, rating on there? The, was it, yes, was hang it on, I have it. It is, it got a 16%. Woo! Ooh. Ooh. 16%. Um, it was also apparently nominated for two golden raspberries, but didn't win. They were for worst prequel sequel or worst excuse for a horror movie. How, That's how, fair. Yeah. Okay, I, I gotta ask. Not fair, actually. What what <laughs> worse what worse prequel sequel came out that year? Was it one of the Exorcists, like Exorcism of Emily Rose or it something? Lost to Daddy Day Camp. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 All right. Okay. Couldn't even yep. be the best at being the worst. Um so I, of course, like being being the lover of the Hannibal series that I am, like when it came out. Was a little dubious, but watched it. Um, and I watched it on DVD. I didn't see it in theaters. Um, so I'm I'm gonna go on a limb here because several years later, actually last year, I rewatched this movie, and I've kind of in a strange way changed. I'm gonna silence my phone because it's about. To, I can just tell something's gonna happen. Um, Talk about Hannibal. Somebody's gonna call you. Like, no, don't say you like it. Don't. <laughs> but um, I rewatched it. I think last year. Um, and actually it kind of reversed my opinion on it. Um, and I, the, the reason this came up for me and that's how actually how I came up with the topic was this film. Um, is I rewatched it last week again. I'm like, okay, I just, I have to make sure that I'm right about my opinion this time around. <laughs> um, <laughs> cause I'm, I mean, the critical reviews are bad. <laughs> like it's bad, but here's the thing. I think context was a big part of this film's failure. Um, Even as someone who didn't see it in theaters, 
you have to remember at that time, most people's experience with the Hannibal Lecter series is the movies, the Anthony Hopkins movies, uh, not Manhunter, you know, or the, the, the trilogy. And Brian Cox was not a good. Brian Cox is. I I can't make it all the way through Manhunter. Actually, I it's own not it a good I movie. I can't watch it. It's not I, good. I, I, Hannibal I Rising agree. is watchable in a popcorn okay. crunchy way. Okay. Like, all right. I can agree that Manhunter is the worst out of it's all. It's terrible. Of I tried real hard. Anyway, so, but I think part of the problem this movie had was it came out at a time when that was everyone's experience with Hannibal. And, like, look, I, I adore the Anthony Hopkins films. They're great movie adaptations. I wrote a paper on it in college. But I've got to say that, you know, circa, you know, over 10 years later, having, you know, a series based on the films done by a different actor with a very different take on this character um, I don't think it's as bad as people originally thought. I actually don't. Hmm. Um, and that's actually what prompted me to go back and watch it is I had been watching Hannibal the series and I don't know what I got on a bender one night and I didn't sleep for like 48 hours and I reread the, oh. I started reading the book. I had owned the book for years, had never read it. And I picked up Hannibal Rising the book because there's a lot of reference to Hannibal Rising in the TV series. And I'm like, let me like go and look at the source material and see, um, you know, like where they're pulling from because they did take some creative liberties, which I think were very well done overall. Um, the timeline doesn't quite work for for Hannibal the TV series. The timeline does not quite work with him growing up circa World War II. Um, so I think they kind of took some liberties in that department, right. um, but they're not real obvious. And so I pulled the book out and I started reading it. Well, it turns out you can read that book in one night without sleeping. It's a real easy read. I'm terrified um, by your very tired reading habits. Like, hmm, I haven't been able to sleep. What should I read? Ah, Hannibal Lecter stories. That'll put me right to bed. Actually, that's how I originally read Silence of the Lambs as well. At night. Oh, have mercy. <laughs> at what night, is your night? alone in college. Never Jeez. take an Ambien. Your nightmares are going to be terrifying. Oh man, they are. I, I read uh, Stephen King's uh, Insomnia. In the same I mean, well, that's, that's just a <laughs> what in the actual heck, you two? <laughs> so I decide on this Holy. night when I can't sleep that I am going to read Hannibal Rising, and I get about two chapters, and I'm like, "This is really good. I should put the movie on and see how they line up." Because the, like, for all of its ease of reading, the level of gory detail that this book gets into um, is quite terrible. And, and, and the subject matter is very dark, even in the beginning. Um, talking about Lithuania and World War II. Um, it's horrifying. So I'm reading this. I'm like, I want to see how this it matches up with the movie. So I put the movie on, and I just put it on repeat over the course of reading the book. So I got through it about three times. And... <laughs> <laughs> Sweet dreams. On repeat. Um, I didn't go to sleep. I wasn't worried about it. <laughs> speaking, you never speaking will again. Stock, apparently. Stock, huh. well, speaking of Stockholm syndrome, right here. Yeah. <laughs> so, come to realize actually that um, Thomas Harris wrote the screenplay for oh. Animal Rising, okay. and so it is pretty on point with the book. Um, it's one of probably the most faithful adaptations I've ever seen. You can see clearly where they made the decisions to cut things out. Um, it all made a lot of sense for, uh, I think, the, I don't know what the runtime movie is. I'm going to say 138 minutes, you know, whatever. For the amount of time they had, they, they made the choices that they made. They did make sense. I, I, there's one major failing to this movie, and I do feel like it is, there just was not enough room for the context that was needed. Okay, Th this is a story that needs a lot of contextual clues, and in a in a film, it's hard to get all that in there. Um, so one of the big critical um, complaints about the movie were reducing Hannibal Lecter to you know a series of, of basically psychopathies, um, which I kind of take issue with that as a critique because it's the psychological horror, like that's the whole point. Right. Is to be an origin story for a psychopath. Right. And I don't, I really don't feel like it was reductive at all. 
Um, yes, like I said, some contextuality was lost in the adaptation, but overall it's, it's genuinely faithful. I think a lot of its problem though was you had a new actor, a younger actor who was very exotic for what we were used to seeing. Um, and I think now looking at it, go ahead. Who did they get the blame? It was, um, give me a second. I, I have it pulled up because notes. They're handy to have. I don't make them because uh, I Gaspard, like going after them. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher this guy's name. Gaspard uh, Julio. Never heard of him. He's French. Um, God, it takes a lot for me to go. I don't know who that actor is. <laughs> yeah, actually, he was, an, he was an unknown actor. He was much, obviously, much younger, playing a young lector as a teenager. Um, right. Very exotic. Very did not mesh with the Anthony Hopkins view that we had gotten thus far of Hannibal Lecter, which in retrospect, I'm going to say, having seen, this is, this is where I get into unpopular, unpopular opinion territory, mm -hmm. um, which was one of my fears when, when Hannibal the series came out with Mads Mikkelsen, um, whose name I also butcher because I am not Danish. Um, That's how we all say Mads, and I know that, and I still pronounce it Mads. Anyway. Yeah, everybody, everybody does I know everyone in America. Does. But anyway, I, I do it all the time. But um, it was one of my fears with that as well. But honestly, when you go back and you look at the source material and you read the books, that is a huge part of that character that I really think all, all honor to Anthony Hopkins' performance. It, it, they did lose that in his performance. They didn't have... They they lost some of the charm there, and they lost some of the the draw that the exoticism of the character has. Which, if you look at Hannibal Rising in context with Hannibal the TV series, it actually flows remarkably well. Interesting. Um, the two actors actually you can you can make the leap in your mind that oh this is the same character. I'll tell you what would be an interesting thing. So. There is a movie called Loaded Weapon 1. It was a spoof of the Lethal Weapon series. Uh, and they only ever made one of them. And in that, there is a... Because they do spoofs of a lot of movies in that movie. And mm -hmm. one of them is Silence of the Lambs. And F. Murray Abraham plays the Hannibal Lecter character. Uh -huh. And what you're explaining right now, kind of like an ambiguous ethnicity, um, maybe a little more gaunt and a little more kind of inherently scary... Uh -huh. maybe someone like F. Murray Abraham would be an interesting choice for an older lector because with Anthony Hopkins, I get too much British gentleman, even when he tries yeah. to hide his accent. He actually like, comes off a little Southern in some moments. Yes. Like, he, he almost gets this Southern twang going on in some moments. A lot of um, uh, English actors when they're doing American accents tend to do Southern accents because it's closer to an English accent in mm -hmm. terms of how your mouth moves. So a lot of, so the easiest, the easiest accents for a lot of British actors is Southern accents. You can take mm -hmm. a look at, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember the actors, the guy in Big Fish, he was uh, Albert Finch, I think. Uh, he mm -hmm. is an English actor and he, a lot of the American ac uh, accents he does, Southern, because it's the easiest one for him to do. Um, so but you're actually making a point. He he comes off very in in the three films that everyone thinks of, very British gentleman, which is really when you read the trilogy, not what Lecter is at all. Right. Um, you know, he's very much an amalgamation of the places he's been and the experiences he's had, and that is everywhere. Like, and that's what the yeah. series does such a good job of pulling. But I think part of its failure at the box office and, and even, you know, in, in sales in general um, is that everyone had grown to love this, this version that we knew and that was what we were most familiar with. Right. Source material wise, actually, it's, it's not that far off. It's a relatively watchable movie. It's, it's, it's a good crunchy, but I wouldn't term it horror. Like, yes, there's some gory moments. Um, I, I, I honestly think they have it in the wrong category. It's barely horror. It's far more psychological than it is horror. Right. Um, psychological horror, right? <laughs> it doesn't even veer into horror, though. It's not... There's no part of this tale that... Okay, like, growing up watching Silence of the Lambs as a very young girl, like, there are some things 
in that movie that you're like, don't ever do those things. <laughs> There's yeah. kind of that I, I, kind of. I don't have nearly as much context on Hannibal Rising. So mm-hmm. you could be very right about that. Like I, I, I would argue till my death when Silence of the Lambs is for, but I don't have yes. enough context right. for it. I would, I would challenge, I may challenge you to watch it because I would love to hear your opinion. It really doesn't fall, I don't feel, fully into the horror genre. Right. It's not scary. It's an, it's an interesting little ride. Right. You know. I, th- I think that what they're trying to Dark. do, I think a lot of the Anthony Hopkins characterization stems from one scene in Silence of the Lambs and the whole build up to the introduction of Hannibal Lecter in that scene is that Clarice is walking through the jail and she keeps going past crazier and crazier inmates. You know, you get ones that are relatively calm to ones that are being very violent to ones that are being restrained. And then she comes to this glass partition and there's this incredibly calm, stoic British man on the other side. And so that becomes, that reveal is the entire characterization of the movie version of that character. And so, of course, he's going to become the stoic British gentleman because that's the antithesis to everything you just saw. When the more yeah. interesting individual psychological profile of the character would be the PTSD of coming out of World War II and the horrors and what that does to somebody rather than just them being this cold, clinical, calculating machine that just likes the taste of flesh. Well, yeah. It's like, and also, you've you got to take into the context that he, when he's a teenager, he's not going to be this refined man that no. he is when he is much, it's, much older. It's it the is, journey uh, there, and that's that's the thing. But um, I, I will disagree with you a little bit on what you're saying on that, Paul, because yes, there is that, but that is very much, I, I feel like, more to show, that opening scene much more shows the the calculatedness and his level of mm-hmm. control as a psychopath. It doesn't... It's not so much to do with, um, you know, his, his background or his nationality as it is what he's turned himself into. And, and he is very much that throughout, um, you know, the stories that we see him in, except in the very beginning where we see him becoming it. See, I think this is actually why I like the idea of having a more unknown actor in this role, mm-hmm. because when I see Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter, I think about the entirety of Anthony Hopkins. As soon as I see him, I see the elephant man. I see uh, Howard's end. I I see all the things that he's been in, in my head. The second I see him and I think British dude, it's the same problem with Benedict Cumberbatch being Dr. Strange. I'm like, Oh, it's not, Oh, that's Dr. Strange. It's, Oh, there's Benedict Cumberbatch doing an American accent. How about that? And it's not Southern for some reason. Yeah. And I think that was actually That was some of the brilliance in this movie that kind of got missed, unfortunately, due to contextual issues. Mm -hmm. Um, And in in Hannibal, the TV series, where we slowly started to realize it, we were like, oh, hang on. This isn't what we thought. Because the beauty of bringing in, you know, someone like Matt Nicholson that's not well known at the time in America, he was not the actor he even is now, and he's still not that well known. But he's, he's, I mean, he's known now, but he's not Anthony Hopkins. Um, right. but He's the thing is, at the time, years. at the time he was relatively, you know, ubiquitous, a, a relatively ubiquitous, ugh, words, a relatively unknown actor to stick in this role. Right. And it was just enough of a wild card for you to, for them to allow, to allow themselves to rebuild the character in people's heads. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes but, sense. Anyway, my, my argument to Hannibal Rising is that it is it actually is a pretty decent adaptation for trying to make a movie out of that book. And, you know, I, I think a lot of the critical issues had to do with the context in which it came out. I think had it come out after the series, it would have done far better. Well, I wonder if it'll get a critical reappraisal, kind of like Blade Runner got a critical reappraisal. Blade Runner was not super well received when it came out, and now it's this incredible classic. And this is one of the things that I will take issue with with Roger Ebert to my dying breath is that Roger Ebert would not revise his two-star review of Blade Runner after that movie became what it is now. Mm-hmm. He, kept, he kept the line that it was a mediocre movie 
I'm like, you gave three and a half stars to Star Wars Episode One. Go back and watch Blade Runner and tell me that that's not better than Star Wars Episode One. If you do that on Star Wars Episode One, you should lose your credit card. He really, yeah. Well, I mean, his only screenwriting credit was Beyond the Valley of the Shadow of the Dolls. So I'm not really. <laughs> he was a genius. It's just I don't agree with him in in, in his entirety. Uh, but no, that that's that's a that is a fascinating thing. The idea that then it will get it might get a critical reappraisal as people may rediscover it as time goes along. And that happens with a lot of stuff. I doubt it. I don't know that anybody remembers it well enough for that. Well, see, here's the thing. You never know. But it is like, it is like winning the lottery with some movies. The only reason that we know about uh, the movie, um, the uh, oh gosh, it's the, the Jimmy Stewart Miracle Christmas movie. I can never remember the name of. I keep wanting to say uh, Miracle on 34th Street. It's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. Thank you. I I keep wanting to say Miracle on 34th Street, but that was a success right out of the box. Chris Kringle. But but yeah, but It's a Wonderful Life was not well received when it was released. It was a, it was a flop and actually really hurt John Ford, the uh, director's career. Uh, Jimmy Stewart had to recover from it. But the reason we know about it was that it lapsed into the public domain. So TV channels could show the movie for free and Uh they did. A lot. And it became a classic because everybody was just like, well, it keeps getting shown. I guess it must be great. And, and it became what it is because of that. So movies can get the reappraisal that they need. So, it just, you know. I, I also think that there's, there's two things I think it was a smidge ahead of its time on. Jeremy, you, you know more about horror as a genre than, than I probably do. And I'll let you weigh in on this. Um, because like I said, one of the, um, one of the real critical, uh, complaints was, uh, they felt like it reduced it to, you know, a handful of psychological traits, which I disagree with. You're, you're talking about a psychological story. Um, it, that, that is what we should be talking about. That should be what's interesting about it. Um, so I don't, I don't know how you feel about that comment, but, um, my other thing is I've noticed this ha- Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, it's like, uh, you don't, you don't want your monster to be a fully fleshed out human. You don't want to humanize your monster too much mm-hmm. in horror. And I don't, and, I don't feel like It's like, it. yeah, yeah. Well, like saying, saying that he was just reduced to mm-hmm. these things. I was like, no, no, he kind of should be like these elements that create him to be like this thing that is terrifying rather than yeah. saying he's a person well right. he should be a more fleshed out character right that, and that's what i feel like um once again the series did beautifully is they they hit on all those things but in such an amalgamation that it's undefinable and that's what yeah. makes him scary right. um it, it's because this this is a monster that's unpredictable and doesn't seem like a monster. It's a it's a fatal mistake that the the remakes of the Halloween movies did. Oh, yeah. They they humanized overly. Michael, yeah, Michael Myers. Yeah. It's like, why would you do that? The genius of the kid is putting on the mask, and that's all you know about his background. See, this is he's why he's much more of a monster. That's right. why you can believe when he gets shot in the face with a gun, he's suddenly back. Right. When there's a mystery there, that's why the Joker in The Dark Knight works so well, because he would give you false narratives about his own past. You have no idea who he is. You don't know what the actual story is. Which is why even as brilliant as Joker stories that give him a background, like I love Tim Burton's Batman. It's it's great, but knowing that the Joker is Jack Napier cheapens it. Uh, even uh, the Killing Joke. The Killing Joke is a great comic and a great uh, uh, adaptation into live, in, not live action, but into animation with Mark Hamill as a Joker and Kevin Conroy as Batman. But you see the Joker's backstory. You know who he is. What the genius of the Dark Knight is is the Joker keeps. He's an unreliable narrator. He keeps giving you a different story for where he's from and how he got his scars every time, and you never know his background. Same with the animated. Uh, Batman animated series uh, Joker, even though they, there was a throwaway line in one of the episodes that he was Jer- Char- uh, Jack Napier, but they contradicted that later on anyway. But not knowing the history of the person 
is very important for making them a monster. Even if you go through all the steps of wiping away the humanity and you see the humanity wiped away, what you're left with is still a human being who's flawed rather than a monster. Um, and Because when you see the person being a human at any point, you lose them being a monster and it's gone. I have nothing more to add to that. I, I keep expecting... <laughs> I try to I try to leave space for you guys. Uh, we and, just like uncomfortable, uh, so we just stare at you when you do that. Now. Like, <laughs> it's like okay, okay. Um, but actually, like the thing is, I'll I'll make the argument. Like they actually do the book, both the book Hannibal Rising and um, the series, and and to some extent the movie with its lack of context does a remarkable job of that. Um, there is quite a bit of unreliability in the story that you're getting. Um, okay. The TV show is able to take that further because the timelines don't quite match up with the original story and they leave a lot of it up to your interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he will never really tell the story is the thing. Right. So you don't really know, you know, we, we all kind of know what happened, we think, but he, he will never say it um, much like the Joker in the dark Knight, um, And also he doesn't give the responsibility for it to that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think makes the, the TV Hannibal very, very interesting as a character is yeah. he takes full responsibility for what he does. He doesn't put it on, this happened to me. Right, right. That's a very, so. that's very interesting. Huh. But anyway, I will say, I think, I think there's some merit to this movie that just got slammed when it came out, is, is my point. <laughs> so yeah, well, <laughs> it's not as bad you know. as we thought. <laughs> So, action so speaking, speaking of pineapples under the sea. Yeah. 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 Speaking of uh, sponges and bobs. What a transition. <laughs> Hannibal to SpongeBob SquarePants. I got the bends. Uh, from, now, bye. <laughs> like, uh, so, yeah, when I was, let's see, 15, no, 16 years old when SpongeBob SquarePants came out, 1999. Oh. And I have been my entire life a huge animation fan i love animated things uh looney tunes probably the my favorite single animated thing that has ever been um and when spongebob came out i hated it so much this annoying sponge and, and part of it was i think the environment when i was first watching it um you know, i was very much from the world of ren and stimpy where I, I loved uh, the weird stretch and squash that, and John Chris Felucci's kind of dark humor, which you can't like John Chris Felucci anymore. Thank you, John, for being a weirdo. Um, and I came, up, I came from the world of very dark. I loved uh, like Akira and very dark anime like that. So then seeing SpongeBob SquarePants and just this annoying yellow sponge and his dim-witted pink, starfish friend and the annoying squid neighbor and his skin flint crab boss and i just like this is the dumbest thing i've ever seen i don't understand why people <laughs> and and people kept talking about it and like, i mean to be fair by. that's still my opinion and well hey that's fair um you can hold opinions however you want uh and the thing is that then Along comes Invader Zim, which I really, really love and still love to this day. And it was gone in like a year and a half. And I, I tend to blame some TV shows for the loss of other TV shows. Fair. Uh, I blame Pokemon for the death of Batman and Superman, the animated series. I blame Power <laughs> Rangers for the death of the Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon because they were on in competing time slots. Uh, and I blamed shows like spongebob for the death of my other various favorite shows including uh invader zim so there were a lot of years where i wasn't giving it a chance uh and then the that's fine Sorry. and then the movie comes out in 2004 and spongebob had been off the air for about a year at this point uh, they made the three seasons and it was kind of it for a little while and then i started going back and watching some of the episodes and really trying to kind of like you did with bob's burgers i was like okay well it's this cultural phenomenon. Everybody loves it. And I started like, okay, it's okay. There are some episodes that are okay. 
And then I started liking it more and more. And then the new season, uh, it made three new episodes in 06. Um, and then a full new season in 07. And by that point, I was really getting on board with this. It was very strange. Were some people who come from Spumco, John Chris Felucci's old uh, animation unit, um, and they were kind of contributing some of that Spumco humor, some of the uh, running to be humor into it. And I realized that I'd been there the whole time. And it really was to me a revitalization of the anything goes kind of mentality that I saw in early Ren and Stimpy and in Looney Tunes. And some of the brilliant writing and the exploration of character. The brilliant thing about SpongeBob, early SpongeBob, basically after season five, you can just go ahead and pretend it does not exist because it, there might be a sporadic episode here and there that's actually good, but it's very hit or miss. But, those early, but the first three seasons and most of season four and a little bit of season five really explore characterization very well. And they do this with making the characters actually seem like real people because they give them motivations. And even though they're very exaggerated and very cartoony, because it is a cartoon, uh, they each have a why and they each have a grounding in who they are. Whereas... In later episodes, and this happens like a lot with like later seasons of Simpsons, and once you get a show that goes on for a very long time, you start trying to subvert tropes or make funny things happen around the characters and to the characters rather than things being a wellspring from the characters themselves. And those first three seasons of SpongeBob, you really get a sense of who these characters are. They'll do things that will surprise you but are still in fitting with their characters. Uh, one of the more surprising things was in a very early episode where Krusty Krab was trying to deliver pizzas. And yeah. SpongeBob and Squidward get lost. Well, at the end of the episode, and Sponge, Squidward does not like SpongeBob, and SpongeBob is completely unaware of this throughout the entirety of the series. Mm -hmm. But there's a moment where they go to deliver the pizza, and they finally get to this person's house. They've been out in the wilderness for days, and the guy lays into SpongeBob because SpongeBob didn't have a drink. The guy didn't order a drink, but he's like, where's my drink? And SpongeBob did everything he could, like fought tooth and nail to get this pizza here and only to have the door slammed in his face. And there's this moment where Squidward feels so bad for SpongeBob that he picks up the pizza and throws it in the face of the customer. And this is something that would not happen in later seasons of SpongeBob. This is a very, this is a very human moment. Where, some, where you see a character that's known for not having empathy, having empathy, because they get to see this person finally as a person. And it's a very interesting moment. And so I saw all these different interplays in this series that I hadn't seen before because I was dismissing it outright. And I really kicked myself for doing that because I missed the heyday when it was happening because I'm a contrarian. This is, me. This, is, this is all just an AA meeting for me. <laughs> so you can get the, your, you know, this whole, I come that, out I come that way sometimes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. This whole show that we do is just me being Paul, like, hi, I'm Paul. Hi, I'm a contrarian. contrarian I'm a contrarian. <laughs> hi, Paul. So. Hi. What so, is your contrarian uh, story for today? SpongeBob. SpongeBob. SpongeBob in the Dark Knight. Uh, plus, Pantera was in an episode of SpongeBob, so that alone should have made me really love them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and there's so many moments that are, it's a very memeable they, show. They had they, they had a very like a it was the very Looney Tunes episode very early on too. Yeah. Uh, if you remember uh, Squidward. There was an episode with Squidward, and he's trying to play his clarinet. But every time he tries to play his clarinet, some sort of weird noise is happening outside of his house. Yep. I remember that episode, actually. <laughs> yeah. And he, he just looks outside, and they're playing with a box. Yeah. Oh, this is, a br this is a, the, the Looney Tunes thing I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. It, that's exactly. <laughs> so for those who haven't seen the episode, um, the Squid, uh, uh, Spongebob and Patrick are outside playing with uh, like a refrigerator box out in front of Squidward's house and Squidward keeps hearing these sound effects coming out of it that are amazing like the perfect sound effects like, the, like uh, uh, Spongebob and Patrick are climbing up a mountain and you hear the rushing wind and the, the pickaxe <laughs> going into the rock and then you hear an avalanche and 
Squibber will open up the box real fast, and it'll just be them sitting there. Like it, 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 all of this would always happen right before he's playing the clarinet. Of course, immediately. Um, <laughs> so it's it's those kinds of things where they really try to make it a cartoony thing, but like they'll have Squidward acting like, no, this isn't a cartoon. This isn't supposed to happen. <laughs> so you like, get the little bit of subversion Daffy of the tropes Duck, in there too. Daffy Duck, Bugs Bunny type stuff going on. Right. There, yeah. Right. But instead, the I hated this show is I was like right on board with Squidward. I'm like, no, no. Oh, I'm totally Squidward is completely correct. The episode where Squidward accidentally uh, tries to kill SpongeBob with a with a bomb that's a pie, maybe the great. There are things that happen in that show. Like, how was this on kids' TV? There's an episode where uh, SpongeBob and Patrick take Mr. Krabs on a panty raid. There's yeah, I remember that. Yeah, there's an episode where where SpongeBob and Mr. Krabs think they've killed the health inspector and they try to dispose of the body. That's one of the best. The moral of of this story. The moral of this story is kids are far less impressionable than you think they are. Really? Like, there's there's one where us us us. Uh, SpongeBob and Sandy are trying to escape this gigantic uh, sea worm. It's kind of like with the creatures from Tremors. Oh, yeah. And push. The, yeah, the push that, what if we just push the city out of the way? Um, but, <laughs> but SpongeBob uh, is looking for like stuff in his pockets to like help them out. And Sandy's going to try to MacGyver them out of the situation. She's like, hey, you have a paper clip. And he's like, I, yes, I do. I know what you're thinking. He's like, here we go. I made it into an S for SpongeBob or Sandy. That way they can identify our bodies. I'm like, did he just say, what? (laughs) And you had all these moments in that show like that that were very much Looney Tunes. The stuff that was basically for an adult, but in a kid's, like that was what maybe the last real show uh, up to season four or so that was really for adults and kids. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of, of great cartoons. There are others that have come around since then, I think, but none to the level that SpongeBob has accomplished. Um, yeah. Like, you know, Gravity the, Falls and a few things. Gravity like Falls is a, is a good yeah. example. Uh, Phineas and Ferb seems to be a popular one, but I'm still not on board with Phineas and Ferb. I still can't stand it. Um, <laughs> but SpongeBob totally reversed me because it made me realize that there was a lot more to it than the, the cartoony exterior. And the first season was still done with actual ink and pen rather than uh, done. I, in will, I will say this for, for SpongeBob, even as I'm not a fan of it. Um, I, I do find it quite sad how um, it, speaking of reducing things, uh, cartoons, I feel like are one of those things that used to be very, even as adults watchable, and we could find something there. And, and the beauty right. of it is, like, I mean, I grew up watching, you know, movies like Mrs. Doubtfire with my family. Mm-hmm. And not until I was adult did I realize, like, some of the things that are in that movie. Oh, gosh. It, There's a- as, as children go completely over their heads. And we didn't notice. And nobody cared. And it, oh, but there's, there's, one line. there's one line in, uh, in, in Mrs. Doubtfire that, Basically, unless you know Yiddish or at least know the reference, it will completely go over your head. Where he's trying to go through the different disguises, and there's one point where he mentions getting um, I forget what the word. Just avert your ears if you don't want to hear some gross stuff. What the word in Yiddish for foreskin is, but he mentions a moil, which is the guy who does the circumcision, and he mentions, and the translation is, I had to get the bloody foreskins from the guy who does the circumcisions except it says it in Yiddish. <laughs> oh goodness and if you know what you're listening for you'll hear him basically saying this uh, and that's just Robin williams improvising uh there's a lot of that kind there's of there's a lot of that kind of humor in in movies and and in tv shows that were meant yeah. for kids and families at that time and i just don't see a ton of that anymore no. um it's hard watching a kid's show, and it's I've had to really watch it. It's really hard watching kids' cartoons today. I have a niece yeah. and a nephew, and I've got friends with kids, and I'm just like, oh, my God. Like, I don't even know what kids are watching these days. Yeah. So. Other than Gravity Falls, what is there in the last 15 years that really is a good that and adults even, and kids can enjoy? I see it even happening in, like, the animated movies. Um, 
of like there there used to be you know i would go watch pixar movies and disney movies even as an adult you could still enjoy them now i don't find them enjoyable um so much you know yeah i, I would say toy I, story 4 was yes, solid there's, yes there's some exceptions but i'm saying the in general peak stuff the, the two levels are missing dramatically yes. from they are kids and family tv they really but are. But there's Boss Baby. Come on, yeah. everybody loves Boss Baby. Actually, anyway, um, a, a good a good uh, for adults and kids was uh, Penguins of Madagascar on Nickelodeon. That was actually a really solid one, uh, mostly because I most of the jokes ended around violence, which I liked. Um, <laughs> we all laugh at violence. We all laugh at violence. Yeah. He exploded. <laughs> And part of this is, is due to a lot of shows, again, this is the, uh, the problem of comedy having to appeal to different audiences around the world because co- comedy is often so um, localized to be really, truly hilarious. So you have to go with for the cheaper kind of humor, which kids are generally going to enjoy if you want those shows and movies to play for audiences in China and audiences in Europe. And it just kind of kills... It kills the ability to do I mean, those I grew up jokes. on like the sand lot. And <laughs> yes. People still say, you're killing me, Smalls. It's still on t-shirts. I love There's some stuff in that movie so that went over my head. I'm just saying. So, uh, so Jeremy, what was, your, what was your next example? My next example, it has to do with bowling. Hmm. It has to do with uh, a guy named The Dude. Oh, gosh. Uh, you, didn't yes. like, you didn't like The Big Lebowski when you first saw it? I hated The Big Lebowski the first time I saw it. That is such a you kind of movie, though. I'm shocked by this. <laughs> it was like, first time I ever watched it, uh, I had a group of friends over at the house, and uh, we did a movie night. And another one of my friends was like, you have to watch this movie. You have to watch this movie. It's like my favorite movie of all time. And it's like, okay, we'll, we'll watch that watch that movie and like part of the way through you know see the thing is back when you're back in high school all right and you have a group of friends over you know you're gonna be talking a lot and stuff Mm -hmm. like that even during the movie and all that stuff so we're we're all kind of watching the movie and i just completely lose interest because there's no there's no anchor in that movie because it's all irreverent it's all pointless stuff that just happens to this guy and that's kind of the whole point of the movie and it just completely went over my head because i was not paying close attention to what was going on yeah so i ended up disliking it and somehow i ended up watching it a second time that second time i liked it more i was like oh this isn't so bad now that I'm actually seeing what's going on here. And right. then I watch it again and again and again. Now I've watched this movie so many times now. I, I'm not sure if there's a movie, like maybe Terminator 2 is like one of the few movies I've seen more than this movie. And that's because when I was a kid, I watched Terminator 2 a million times. <laughs> you're, too, you're like, Sydney's falling asleep to Silence of the Lambs. You're a toddler over Terminator 2 playing. I love this. This is fantastic. Hey, I watched Terminator 2 for a while as a kid. Like, Oh, gosh, yeah. I love that movie. My like, early teens were filled with Terminator and mm-hmm. all kinds of terrible dystopic action films. Good. So, yeah, it, it, look, Silence of the Lambs taught me not to pull over on the side of the road and help people. <laughs> that's, that's why that's you don't help people. Learn. That's good. Uh, that is because you will be taken to a basement and dropped into a well and skinned given lotion yes uh. <laughs> i'm four foot eleven i'm not doing it i know this story like life lessons and if you need real proof look at ted bundy who was caught like 100 miles from here so <laughs> okay this is getting really too real here and dark uh let's let's get back to the All big right. lebowski which big just lebowski, involves not irreverent humor that uh <laughs> i love that movie really? it's all about that movie's entirely about miscommunication that's the whole thing it, everybody's that is the, master the whole each other the whole movie I, have a good fact that I haven't seen it and i really need to watch it my cousin's been telling me for like three years like, oh man i <laughs> we uh me and my roommate uh we do big lebowski nights and stuff like that he'll even get like like when we do lebowski night 
all you can do is eat and drink things that are in the movie. So, you know, you, you have your white Russians, you have beer, you have Sioux City sarsaparilla, you have peanuts, and that's really- oh, post, well, post COVID, we have to be invited, right? Like- We have to well, do this. Of course, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, positive, absolutely. That's fantastic. But yeah, man, it, but one thing that I absolutely love about this movie is the fact that each time I watch it, I learn to appreciate it more. And there's more and more little details that, uh, that I discover. It's like one of the more recent ones that I discovered was uh, when, when they're, they're sitting at this diner and he's talking to another one of the characters and he, the character is getting ticked off. And it's like, I'm drinking my coffee. And it's like, and he's like, okay, I'm getting out of here. So he just throws some money down on the counter. And as he's walking away, he realizes, oh, I threw something on the counter. I shouldn't have grabs it and starts walking away. But he threw in the other thing that he threw on the counter was a joint. <laughs> <laughs> and just that little detail of just him throwing change on the counter. And he's like, oh, gosh, that's drugs. And just slipping it back in his pocket and nonchalantly walking out, you know. <laughs> And it, the, his eyeballs just go so wide when yeah. it happens. And, like, and I didn't discover this until like 10, 10 times That's in great. watching that movie, you know? It's so. wonderful. It's, a lot, it's, <laughs> it's such a little moments movie. Oh my gosh. Oh, uh, the, it, it's incredibly quotable, you know? Like, oh, if, yes. If you ever have your phone ring near me, I will always say, phone's ringing, dude. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Fair, you're nihilists. Is probably my favorite line of the movie. Uh, that's not fair. Um, yeah, The Big Lebowski is one of those ones that that is also a, a critical reappraisal movie because it wasn't huge when it came out. Not that most Coen Brothers movies are huge when they come out, uh, but that was one that was a slow burn with people because even among Coen Brothers fans, that was it's like it miscommunicated with its target audience until they got <laughs> yeah, really until did. people realized that that was the point. You know. My thing is, it, though, that they tear apart a C4 Corvette, which makes my soul hurt a little bit, but whatever. Um, <laughs> it also has one of the best censorship moments of all time. If you ever see the movie on, like, network television, right. uh, like, they're cursing uh -huh. all over. They're cursing in the movie all over the place. And they're, 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 there's a moment in the movie where the, the moment he was just talking about with the Corvette, where he's right. tearing apart this Corvette, and, and he goes, This is what happens. This is what happens, Larry. What do you find? A stranger in the Alps. Oh, yes. That's where that comes from. That is from. not the original line. But that's, but that, but like, if you've seen Dragon Ball Z abridged, you know, that's exactly, yeah, and yeah that's, uh, that's fantastic. I, I did not realize that's what, I, my favorite, okay, my favorite TV censorship moment of all time has got to be in Die Hard when they make it, yippee ki muchacho because it says it so many times and it's, yeah. does, it's not cool it doesn't sound cool and he says it like it's cool yippee ki muchacho <laughs> that is anything wonderful. else there would be good you but... have to rack up a top list of tv censorship moments <laughs> Oh yeah, that and is, the best part oh is, my gosh! Oh, and the best part—it's clearly not Bruce Willis saying it, <laughs> and they only replace the word "muchacho," so it's like the whole movie goes silent around that word, where you hear all. Oh this, my gosh! Oh, so all of a sudden, all the the white noise and everything like that sound effects just oh, cut out. Just cut out, you know, yippee ki yay, muchacho. <laughs> just, doesn't you, match the need... lips. Nothing. Like, just you're gonna bleep to, it. You're going to need to just overdub that. To, just bleep to, it out. Just show just, that. Just bleep it out. It's, yeah. Just, <laughs> feel like Paul does with me. Yes. On the podcast. Like any other noise. Like another, do more often. Oh, okay. Another one of my favorite ones is yeah. from Liar Liar. Oh, I was, I was uh, just going to mention this one. Yes. yes. <laughs> he's like, he's uh, in the bathroom beating himself up. And the guy... Walks in, he's all freaking out, like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm kicking my own butt. <laughs> Do you mind? That's not the moment I thought you were going to mention. 
Oh, I thought you were yeah. gonna mention What's the, the other court, one. The courtroom scene, uh, oh. where, where he's talking about uh, Jennifer but, Tilly's character had been sleeping around on her husband, and he comes up with all these euphemisms. Uh, <laughs> but the only one they they get out was that he was uh, what's, what was it? it was like uh, he stuffed her like a Thanksgiving turkey, and they replaced every subsequent <laughs> euphemism with him gobbling like a turkey. So he's clearly <laughs> saying things, but you just hear that's all you hear for like 12 seconds over top yeah, of Jim Carrey, obviously mouthing words. It's fantastic. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're like, that's why I love uh, kicking my own butt one because yeah. he's really saying, you know, ass. And it's like his mouth, it's, it's a close up shot of his face. So all you can see is his mouth saying ass. <laughs> <laughs> the word coming out does not I match. Say, I still love that movie. Oh, oh it's, gosh, it's one of my favorite comedies of all time. Me I've got too. one that made it into the theatrical release. Have you ever oh seen gosh. Galaxy Quest? Have you seen Galaxy Quest? Yes, I have. Okay. I have. Yeah. There was a scene, they wanted to keep the movie PG, so they had to cut a line where uh, on screen, uh, like looking at her mouth, uh, Sigourney Weaver drops an F-bomb. Well, they wanted to keep the PG release, so they had to redub her saying, well, screw that instead of the other word. But she's still so clearly in the theater full of children saying, well, F that. <laughs> and I remember as a because I was 16 when that movie came out, I saw in the theater, like, that is not what she said. That is <laughs> not amazing. at all. What she said, but they wanted to keep the PG rating, so they had to cut the F bomb. That is. Amazing. Oh my gosh, we can make this whole anyway. thing about weird swearing. Uh, so okay, so we got one more example. One more. Of, all right. Of, and Sydney, it's all you. So my other one is mostly because uh, Jeremy knows I've been playing Breath of the Wild. Finally, you know, three years. <laughs> um, and I got a lot of contentions with that game that we'll talk about another time. Right. Jeremy and I are going to have to have a conversation about this game. Um, but um, actually, so one of the other ones I've been thinking about because I've been playing Breath of the Wild is The Legend of the Zelda, The Wind Waker, which is a game that I was not thrilled about when it came out. I didn't hate it. Not is like, this, oh, it's terrible. Is this the GameCube one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the cell shaded cell graphics one? Okay. GameCube, yes, addition to the series. So... This is, I believe, in my opinion, another contextual issue. Um, it's not that the game was was horribly received. Um, I think there was there was some kind of like mm, about it. Um, I was definitely in that crowd because up until then we had come off of uh, I think Ocarina of Time was right before that, and Majora's Ocarina of Time was mass. And, yeah, yeah, the two that like and two of the greatest games the in the two. series right before it. The two. <laughs> the two. And yeah. Up. If you had been following gaming news at that time, like everybody was was aiming at a more photorealistic Zelda, we thought it would just be a natural progression into what later became Twilight Princess. Um, it, it also didn't help that you know they had the demo of the GameCube show a realistic Zelda. As it did, well. so. it, and and it was it is very much what later became Twilight Princess. I think um, they they took a lot of the work that they did, um, but they did they were teasing at a photorealistic. Somewhere along the way, they took a left turn and decided to do a thing. <laughs> With these big eyes. Cartoonish. Yeah. Cell <laughs> shaded graphics. Yeah. And we were all like, okay, I guess we'll give it a shot. <laughs> Was not what we were there for. Right. So we we got this game and and I played it when it came out and and it's not a it, it never was a bad Zelda game. I'm not gonna say it was. It was right. definitely not what we were angling at at the time. Um, but what's funny is I, I didn't care for it. Um, I also didn't care for at the time where they took the mythos um, because it was a real break with the mythos of the Zelda games at that time. Um, taking it kind of, you know, into several hundred years later and what's happened to rule, and we have different races we're dealing with now in different areas and... It really is the first one where you saw there's clear evidence of an actual timeline. It is. 
It is. It's the first time it was not just like, theoretically, these could be the same character. There was a lot of debate in the fandom up until that point, and then Wind Waker came out and said, stop debating. <laughs> now you see what it is. And we were all like, okay, I guess. That's fine. You can do that. Um, and I, I still I still have my reservations about that aspect of it. What I what I still don't like about the game is that it did lead us to what later became Phantom Hourglass, which w I draw the line at Steam Trains. Got like yeah. Zelda? No, no trains. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Could not play it. Phantom Spirit Hourglass Tracks is great. And, and the the other one that came after it, those those two were no. Phantom, Phantom Hourglass was eh. And, and then the one, what was the one Spirit but Tracks? Spirit Tracks, Spirit Tracks was fantastic. Was it? Because I couldn't, I, oh, I saw yeah. a train and I was like, no. Um, Very good. <laughs> stop putting trains in my medieval fantasy land. Um, <laughs> That's a good point, though. So that, that, that was where I drew the line. But I later on, coming back to it, I actually do, to this day, adore Wind Waker as its own little game. Um, and as, a, as an addition to the Zelda series. Um, it's one of my favorite Zeldas to pick up and play, like, just out of nowhere. Just It's always fun. I actually think now, looking back on it, the graphics have aged beautifully. Cell Shaded graphics yes. age great. Yes. Always. There's a first-person shooter called 13 that the gameplay, it's pretty good, but they did the whole thing in Cell Shaded first-person graphics. And mm -hmm. it's still, I mean, that game is, I think it came out in, like, 07 or so. Mm -hmm. uh, it had a lot of you know A-list actors yeah. at the time, like David Duchovny. I think those are earlier than that because that was a GameCube game as well. Earlier than that. Uh, but anyway, so like, but the other thing is that they did do an HD re-release of the game on Wii, Wii U. Or, yeah, Wii U. Wii U. Yeah. Um, and phenomenal. actually, I have not played that version, but I heard that they removed a lot of the the one portion of the game that was very time-consuming and monotonous. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which I they, think they, they made it quick. They streamlined it. Yes. They didn't remove no. it, but no, yeah. I know. But what I um, which I think was an excellent choice because it is the one part of the game that does really drag on you. And honestly, when I replay it, it's a lot of the times it's where I stop. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot I don't of people have do. the HD version. I have the original. Um, I, I've stopped there too. <laughs> I think I'm everyone guilty. who's played it has stopped there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's a, it's a beautiful little game. It's fun to play. It, it's enjoyable. It's got a great story. It, like I said, I don't really love what it did the, for the mythos, but as its own little mythos, I think it's it's cute and quite quite well done. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like for a game that I originally hated, honestly, it's probably m one of my most picked up and played Zelda's behind Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. Interesting. Um, I, I still, I honestly, when when Twilight Princess came out, that was the Zelda I had been waiting for. But um, as far as as far as a fun little game to play that has just remained super enjoyable over the years and very engaging and gorgeous, uh, it's it's impressive for for a game that I was like eh, when it first yeah. came out. It's hard to beat. So it really is. Up. So this is, and I'm, I'm going to make this point. Uh, we, we're going to have to wrap this up in just a couple of minutes. We're getting close to the end of our time. We're our self-imposed times that we're trying to do these days. Uh, but one more point I, I want to make about that is I love that they're doing uh, all these kind of HD remasters of games where they're fixing little bugs and little problems. This doesn't really make its way into any other medium. If a comic book sucked when it came out, that's it. That's the way the comic book is forever. Movies might get a director's cut, maybe, and sometimes they're worse. I'm looking at you, Blade Runner. And I think that games can do something that you can't really do in a lot of other mediums where you can go back and you can say, okay, in Ocarina of Time, nobody likes the water level. So maybe we'll make it easier to get your boots back on and we'll make it easier to go through. You don't have to keep going back and turn up the switch and going to your inventory, all that kind of thing. So they make these little things better, uh, like a half-life source and all this kind of stuff. And you can't really do that elsewise. And so games really have an opportunity more than any other to go from something that you either don't like or frustrates you because of one small thing to being genuinely great. And I wish that they did that more often. You know, it's kind of a shame some of these games are like mid-level releases or were good enough, just don't get that kind of yeah. second opportunity. Uh, and I'd really like to see that more often. So. I would too. I would like to see more games do what Wind Waker did and look real hard at, okay, what was the one thing 
Um, I'm looking at you, Breath of the Wild. Um, and and yeah. fix it and make it a genuinely more enjoyable experience. Because at the end of the day, the point of these things is to enjoy playing them. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You should be able to play a game however you want because it's your dang game. You bought it. You paid money for it. Yeah. That's why I like, that's why I like, I miss cheat codes. I miss cheat codes in games. That's such not a thing anymore. I'm like, what if I want to be able to, what if I wanted to have God mode right now and go around? I, I totally miss it? cheat codes. I, you know, those were fun. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I don't want to have to track. Right. <laughs> I've gone through, I've I gone through Doom. I try hard enough in life. Yeah. I've gone through Doom a wow. dozen times. I'm going to do Doom with God mode on and not feel bad about it. So there we are. That's our discussion about things that we started out going like, ah, oh, this isn't very good to being like, no, this is actually really great. And it's very different for depending on what it is. And it can be very contextual. It can be sometimes a, an overall critical reappraisal. So tell us your examples. What are your examples of either properties that you went from loving to hating or hating to loving or what was what needed to get a critical reappraisal in either direction we'd love your examples and we're going to talk about this kind of stuff more we'll get the rating system up uh i promise you it will happen at some point soon and with that i'm not gonna let you guys uh counter me on that because uh i have to maintain some sort of control so i'm paul stadden that's jeremy brazil and that's sydney johnson bye. until next time we're the casual fanatics bye, bye. You two are the casual dramatics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna end it with that statement. That's that's the perfect ending statement.